Hey there, folks. Welcome to the inaugural episode of my brand new podcast, Please Unfriend Me Now, uh, as opposed to my uh, more recent new podcast, which is called The Ramble Transmissions. Uh, This is a podcast where I actually sit down and I chat with uh, various people that I love, uh, admire, I'm inspired by. Uh, Primarily, these these are people I know in real life, and some of them have been dear friends of mine for many, many years. Uh, one of them is the, the person I'm closest to the most, and I'll, I'll leave that little mystery for another date. Um, but I really wanted to, when I decided I wanted to finally, when I finally decided that maybe I do want to do sort of an interview podcast type of thing. I had done all of these uh, interviews, especially during the COVID stuff. Uh, I was asked to do a lot of podcasts, uh, a lot of interviews through podcasts, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, I listened to a ton of podcasts, and I just think it's a great medium. And I guess I I was a little nervous about the idea of being an interviewer. Um, But once I kind of got in the idea that, hey, I can just have conversations like like a normal person with other normal people, right? And uh, we'll just record it, and we'll share it with the world. So that's what we're doing here with this particular podcast. And I think... Um, I think that you'll find, as I do, um, that many of the people that I do sit down and talk with are just absolutely wonderful, brilliant, talented, funny, sexy, um, driven, just just amazing people. Uh, very inspirational. They certainly inspire me. And that's kind of what I'm going for. Uh, some of the people, the names you'll know of, some of the people you won't. Um, but I don't think it really matters. I think that the key here is that these are all uh, just just beautiful individuals, um, just quality and and uh, the, the salt of the earth. Uh, and I think I think you're really going to enjoy some of these conversations. Now, I did uh, initially I had planned to launch this podcast on my birthday, which is March 24th of this year, and um, there were a couple of setbacks, just just technical logistical there kind of some stuff that needed to be ironed out that I just couldn't quite do in time uh and I admittedly it kind of put a damper on it for me I kind of I didn't lose interest I just got a little uh I got the wind knocked out of me it was my own fault it was nobody else's fault I don't even know if it was a fault um I just got a a, a sense of man maybe I don't need to do this you know I, I already do too many other things that I don't need to be doing why am I doing this but I really felt strong about doing this, and and I wanted to do it. I don't know how for how long this will this will go. Right now, we've got about uh, eleven or twelve episodes in the can, as they say, and I'm really very very happy with them. And if 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 I only do these and release these, then I'm I, I feel pretty good about uh, that little contribution to the planet. Um, it's it, it's just for fun, and and I I really have enjoyed uh, thoroughly enjoyed talking with the people I've I've, I've talked to. Uh, I struggled a little bit with how I was going to launch this. I had a very specific plan as to what my episode one was going to be, um, and it, and it was a very personal, uh, heart related thing that I I just had it in my mind. I thought if I can pull this off, this is going to be the greatest uh, for me for my own personal journey. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to do that. Uh, no fault of anybody's. It just didn't quite mesh. Um, so then I had to restructure how I thought about how I would introduce this podcast. Not that it's a big deal. Not that the world's going, what has he got planned? What has he got planned? But I did really want to make it very, very special. And so uh, I you know, I went one direction. I thought that could be perfect. And then I went another direction. I thought that, that too could be perfect. Um, any of these, uh, any of, in any of the folks that I spoke with, could have been easily been episode one or episode ten. It doesn't matter; they're all great. Uh, but I decided to go with somebody who I consider a dear friend and just a major source of uh, inspiration, um, entertainment. He's he's funny as hell, um, just very brilliant and inspirational. And that's my buddy Chris Sherry. Chris, for those who don't know, is an amazing graphic designer artist painter drawer he 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 can work in any medium and he just he, he just makes everything just go um he's been in bands before he's done fanzines uh, he's a great photographer um he he's done so much work for so many bands i can't even name the bands uh, he's done uh, merch stuff album cover stuff 
uh, flyer designs. Uh, primarily, he is uh, known as the Descendants' uh, artist at arms. I came up with that term. Uh, he does a lot of work for the Descendants, uh, and you, you, you know him, his stuff the minute you see it. Um, he's a husband, he's a father, he's a teacher. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm skipping a few things. Uh, but he's one of the m- nicest and most energetic people I've ever met, and also one of the biggest m- uh, music supporters I've, I've ever met. He's incredible. Uh, I hope you enjoy Episode 1 of my new podcast. Please unfriend me now. I promise I'm, th- these, these intros will not be this long. Uh, but please enjoy it. My, fr- my talk with Chris Sherry. Welcome, my friend. Hey, How's it going? I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you're, you're, you're looking well. What do you What do you think of of my sign? I, I love I just, it. Yeah. I thank you. Yeah, was I'm, that was that is that one of those ones that it's it's kind of like the ones outside of the like the the truck stop and you just put the the letters and stuff in. Yeah. Yeah. You it just is, you, did you have that at the Riving Loom? I did, and, and I'll tell you what. Oh yeah, I, and it lights up too. Yeah. Well, this one's special because it lights up different. You can kind of get different colors. It doesn't matter. But I think yeah. we have one of those too somewhere. I don't know. Well, you know what's cool and what sucks about it is when I moved out of my last studio, I had that in the window. So that was the only way that you'd know, like people who were coming for whatever events, you could just see it right up in the corner window outside. One of these just said ribbing loom. And I left it behind when I moved because I the, the curtains were down. Not a big deal. But what was funny is if you go to Google, if you go to Google uh, Street View or Maps, you literally can pull into that little funky lot and you can look up and you can see the little sign. And it's a reminder every time that if I don't know why I have to go and look at it, but it just reminds me I, I love the sign. So, yeah, I had to buy a new one. And these things are kind of there. I don't know why you used to find them for like five bucks at like the dollar store. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But but Not now there, there's a short there must be some kind of weird shortage of them because they're if you go on, online they're like fifteen bucks. I got this for seven, so I, I I did okay. Dude, we we took out the back seat, the very very back seat of our van, and um, we there's pins that that attach in there, and the pins we took out, and then we've mm-hmm. been since moving artwork in and out, and they must have gotten lost in the shuffle or put somewhere. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, well, they can't be too difficult to find, right? So I got on on eBay, took a look, and sure enough, you can find them real easy, but. 50 bucks okay a set yeah. of these things and they're just bent l's and i was like you know what the 50 bucks is worth my time and energy yeah like I, I i imagine you do the same thing i get so hung up on like obsessing over where is this i i tear the entire house apart and and yeah. everything i can to think of and it's not pleasant for anybody in the house because like i i'm a one-track mind yeah yeah, it sucks, and and I I mean I've been to your guys's place. Like you guys have stuff. You it's a very comfy. You got stuff everywhere, but it seems organized. If you go to our oh, house, yeah. it looks kind of like what what that this looks like behind me. <laughs> it's just boxes on top of like you know ma- uh, envelopes on top of CDs. Like it's yeah. just nothing's orderly. It's not filthy. It's just messy and and unorganized. So yeah, to try to find stuff. It just, it just really. So it was worth it. I mean, I just, I went, oh, that's, that's pricey for something like that, but yeah. I need to just do it. So I, yeah. I, and, and I just put them in. So I feel really good. And it's good. At least you got it and you don't have to worry about it and all that I'm stuff. I'm being an adult. I, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, really lately we've been like really on top of things. It, it, feels, it feels good. It feels really it, good. It does. It does. And yes, yeah, the sense of accomplishment. Uh, what the accomplishment? To- <laughs> well, I'm telling you the little things, but it, it means more to me than it ever did. Like I find the littlest things that Alice and I talk about this all the time. You know, like when you, even if it's like a, you make a note to like, uh, a good example is we had in our living room, we just had a, just stacks of Amazon boxes. Right. And I, I don't know why we didn't break them down. We could have easily just, just while talking, we could have been, but we just didn't. We let, we let them stack. And yeah, then we started that. to like trying to move them so we can make more room for the, uh, you know, upcoming, like stupid, really dumb shit. And I'm like, I'm like thinking we're adults. Like we don't, I, you know, we don't have kids that can do it for us. The dogs are worthless when it comes to that. So <laughs> I just got the box cutter on the ones that I had to tear, you know, and, and it feels good. I got that done. And I was like, I did my good thing for the day for the house. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. What a hell of a start to a podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, this is, <laughs> this is, uh, please unfriend me now. And I don't, I don't, I don't want you to unfriend me. I'm, oh, look, I'm wearing your, I'm That's wearing nice. the Chris Sherry. Let's see if we can make the, 
and never mind. And, and with um, yeah, with, with the Willie Bridge. Um, but yeah, yeah. I you I told you before you were on my. I made a short list of folks I wanted to talk to right outside the gate, like going right out, and you were on that. And I consider you a a a, a close personal friend and a great guy and a great artist and a great family man and a dad and a teacher you do everything you're like a renaissance man i am i am yeah i i i don't know how that wound up happening but it's nice i mean and for me i like making sure that like all of that stuff is balanced pretty good because yeah. if you it just seems to me like if if you ignore one of them like everything falls apart and then like you can't do anything well mm. so were you all were you always like that when like when you were younger did you like dabble in different things no, i didn't have a family when i was younger i waited <laughs> well well yeah which is a good move and like me you know i was 13 i was 13 and i had my first born you know and there's yeah, been yeah, seven yeah. since then so no, you know, I but, don't, it goes, yeah, go ahead no i just you know i wonder do, are, were you always because i kind of always was like i always said i was like a dabbler i'd get into something for a little while and then i kind of maybe set it aside because I'd get an another interest and then I'd try to balance them all. And sometimes I'm good at it. Sometimes I suck, but that goes back to when I was a teenager. Yeah. Same with you. Did, were you like, uh, were you always kind of like into just doing a bunch of stuff? Keeping. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, my, my biggest obsession when I first started getting into music was skating too. So mm. like it was, it was skating and, and doing artwork and listening to music. And if I could go see bands going, seeing bands. So those were like, I, and I stuck with those guys for like a really, really long time. And that just kind of blossomed into where I am right now. But I do go on, you know, like avenues where I'm like super into robots for a while, or I'm super into like Hawaiian shirts for a while. And right. So super into like finding, you know, vintage Adidas track suits and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, so is, there's always something. Do you have, have? Do you find it hard to balance? Like, because you you're you're a teacher, you you are a, a, a husband and a father. Is it hard to balance all that stuff? Because you do a lot, not, like like that yeah. goes out to the public. You know, like yeah, it it can be. And I mean, it it was for a while when when our son Sam was first born. Um, I was really 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 busy doing my school stuff. That was when I first got introduced to the drama um stuff that i do now at high school and um i spent so much time there and i i got to a point where i was like this is too much and Lori and i talked about it and you know she was like i i don't want kids to feel like they got more from you than our own kid did mm, and like that wow. really me. and i was like yeah you're right i i need to be there for these students of mine but they should they shouldn't know me better or have a better relationship than my son so i mean I, it is hard to balance at times but i always go all right well if i'm making time for Lori and sam that's that's the main thing and yeah. um they're always really good like both of them are really really good about like working too and they'll they'll keep themselves busy so yeah. if i'm here and i'm doing something chances are they're they've got something to occupy their time so i think we're all in on it it's not just me i mean we're well all it that's a, it, I was going to ask, like, because Lori is super f creative and talented in art stuff. D it, 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 does Sam interest? I d does Sam have an interest in all that? He does a little bit. Um, you know, he's he's more interested in like taking photographs and stuff. And um, you know, he's got he's got a really super creative mind. But his fine motor skills had been affected early on, and mm -hmm. because of that, you know, he he kind of like regrets the 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 fact that he's he's not going to have great motor skills and i think mm -hmm. you know in some ways that's that's been an obstacle for him. i mean he hasn't been thrilled with the fact that he can't just sit down and and draw or spend time drawing the way that you know mm -hmm. i might do stuff like that yeah. so you know he he is super super creative but not in like the physical making of the art but he does do a lot of photographs and stuff like that and he okay. is an incredible like helper so if Lori or i are doing any art shows or anything like that he's great at organizing and getting stuff together and helping us hang things and yeah you know, he's he's a really good second banana he's really which good. is 
I mean, not that, that do, having someone like that in your life who's into it, man. I'd, I'd, I'd love it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know it's great because Lori was was just getting everything ready together for her art show, um, her first solo show down in Southern California, and while she was doing that. You know, she would get finished with a piece and she'd need to get it stretched, but she'd also need to get a frame for it. And if she didn't have a frame already, we've got a frame guy that's, you know, just right around the corner from us. And she'd give the stuff to Sam and just say, go on down, pick out a frame. And he's excellent at that. I mean, he he knows wow. he's got a good eye. So, that's you know, good. he 100 percent trusts him to, you know, find something that's going to work for the piece. Yeah. So he's he is really very creative, but in a different sort of way. Yeah, yeah. It's still yeah. useful and it's still yeah. I, oh, it's super it's useful. Awesome, man. That's great. So um oh, I was gonna I, I always want to ask, like on a on a scale of like one to ten, how good of a skater do you think you are? Now or or when I was well, yeah, when you first started, were you just like a hardcore like you oh, were I was a hardcore skater, but I I wasn't great. Um I, you know, at at the time I would say six or a seven. Okay. Were you were you want like you do ramps and all that? Oh stuff yeah. And, I mean wow. I was again, I wasn't great at a half pipe. I mean, what I really, really liked was um ditches and um you know, street skating. Yeah. That was really for me. And um there were some some skate spots that we would go to in London that were just incredible. And um I mean that's kind of like where I kind of grew up skating was in right. England and um the area where we lived when we first were in the little <laughs> village in England there I mean you couldn't skate anywhere because the streets were like so bumpy so you would have to go someplace like you know the the towns that were close to us were like Felixstowe and Ipswich and then we go into London and there were proper skate places so yeah. you know like ditches and bowls and stuff like that that that's the kind of stuff that I was like super gotcha. into I was, I, I would, I would rate me probably about a nine, uh, well, <laughs> not not today, skating, but judging skate contests. Like I did, <laughs> I did a lot of that and I got really good at it and people would always ask me to do it. You know, Steve and I were always, there'd be like a little skino skate contest and they'd say, can we get seven seconds on me? Yeah. And I was, I got asked back. So I think I'm, I'm about a nine. Right on, right on. That's cool. Well, you know, and it's it's funny because like once a skater, always a skater. You know, like I, I. That's I, what I say. I can't help but you know take my fingers along things and just like pretend I'm grinding. Really? On. Oh, I do. And we'll be driving. And it's so stupid. We'll be like in down in L.A. and I'm I'm driving and I'm looking at embankments. Oh going, yeah, I can see oh, that. I want to skate that. And like it's so bad now that like you know Lori and Sam. Are, they they totally recognize that I do this, and Sam would be like, ah, "That'd be pretty good to skate, right?" You yeah. know, like and <laughs> I'm like, "Yes, it would." And they're not mocking you; they're just sort of looking at. They're not, you know. Well, there's, I don't know. there's maybe I, a little bit of a mock. mockery, but right. Um, right. but good natured. Yeah. But I, I do. I still I look at stuff like that, and and um, you know, it's just a different way of looking at the world because sure. you know, you're you're looking at a crack in a sidewalk, and you're going, "Oh man, I could launch off that." Or yeah, I never understood that. I all my friends were always like the best skaters, and I, I they'd go, they you could see that they were focusing in. Like we'd walk, we'd be walking around to go get something to eat, and they'd see an alley, and there was some crazy, like weird thing where they, yeah. and they'd just be like obsessing over it. And I'd be like, I don't, I've been robbed of that. I'll never understand that excitement of because I, I was never a skater, and I tried, well, I tried. It's cool too, because like you can go into, especially like in cities or things like that, and if you see like markings on walls, you know that's a skate spot. You know, oh, okay, you know right. There's there's an area. Yeah, I mean, there's there's telltale signs of it all over the place. You know, like I'll never a, recognize that waxed a curb or something. Yeah, see that, and you know, just skid marks places. It's it's cool. Yeah, it's a whole it's like thing. a secret world, secret language. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, so you grew, you grew. Where 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 did you grow up? Where, where like when you where were you born? So I was born in Charleston, South Carolina. So That's right. American by birth, Southern by the grace of God. <laughs> so yeah, Charleston, South Carolina. But we lived there for maybe six months. And then my family was from upstate New York. And um, so that that was for a long time when we were young. That was kind of like home base. Okay. And, um, like Whitney Point, Johnson City, um, that sort of area. Um, you're, you're a military brat? You're a... Uh... 
Yeah, my dad, my when I was when I got started, my dad was in the Navy and then he got out and he got into the Air Force and um, he was enlisted in the Air Force for a while. And then he got out to go to officer training school and then went back in. So we moved a lot. But gotcha. his family and my mom's family were, were both from upstate New York. So oftentimes we'd kind of gravitate back towards there. But by no means would I consider myself like you know, from New York or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. So we lived there. We lived in New Jersey. We lived in Texas. We lived in Germany. Uh, and then all of high school was in England. So wow, we, we moved a, a fair amount, which was great. I mean, I just felt like, and you know how that is when you, when you do kind of move, you have to just be a little bit more gregarious uh, unless you just want to stay home and just like not have friends. You kind of have to put yourself out there. So I think because of that, background i mean it kind of helped make me very comfortable talking to people that i don't That's necessarily great. know and um you know just comfortable in in new environments yeah yeah so uh you were in high school and is that when you started skating when you were in high school um i started right before i moved to england okay so right before our high school um we were living in new jersey and uh family friends of ours had given me like a, a really skinny wooden board and yeah. it was it was a proper board you know it wasn't like you know a little cheap plastic one we had those but that first wooden board was like my introduction to you okay this is something a little bit more real yeah. and when we got to england you know i had gotten my first proper board which was a vision agent orange you know board because oh that's of course it's going to be that right right and then that was it i mean i was i was hooked so that was like freshman year of high school like 80 84. okay okay i i had an 84 someone turned me on to my my roommate was a, a great skater and he gave me his old it was a santa cruz Dwayne peters board oh sure you still have like, it yes i do i have it in store i I think yeah. I do still. Yeah. I haven't seen it. So I, I had to think for a second, but it was just so wide. And I thought I tried to do the little skinny decks, but I, I just didn't like it. So the wide ones made a little more sense, but I still sucked at it. But, um, but was there like a skate that I guess, so in 84, was there a pretty strong skate, you know, or, or when you were not, not in England. I mean, it was weird. Cause like, like I said, we moved and we were living in a small village and you really couldn't mm. skate hardly anywhere. Cause the, yeah. the streets were just, so rough um but i i mean i would try on like the the sidewalks and stuff the air force base that we were at that you could skate on because it was you know it was more paved and you know everything yeah. was pretty okay so i i did you know like take my board onto the base and skate but then you have like the security police that are everywhere All and right. so that became a problem of like, well, where do you skate? And, you know, we figured out when the, when the hospital closed, there was nobody around there and security didn't need to go around there and there were painted curbs. So that kind of became like a, a go-to spot. Right. Um, but there was, there was, um, the town of Felix though was a seafront community and they had uh, this, it was called a leisure center. It's, it's basically like a big pool. And I think they had like, you know, tennis um areas in there but around there it was like a boardwalky sort of thing like santa cruz mm -hmm. uh, we'd go and we'd skate around there and they had a half pipe and uh a cement bowl that were leftovers from the 70s wow. and so we'd go and we'd skate on that stuff and they actually did have like a pretty good scene there and uh in ipswich there were things to skate too. And that's where the stupids were from. And like, when I that's met right. those guys, that's kind of when like skating and, and like, you know, hardcore really came together in my backyard. Cause they were, they were just friends of mine. They were people that I went skating with. How were you exposed to like punk rock and hardcore? How did, wouldn't that all happen? You know, it, I kind of came in like easy for, you know, like a lot of people does, um, it was definitely Devo was one of the first bands that that I like really obsessed over. And um, you know, because I had I had seen the video for We're Through Being Cool, and that, you know, has the, the skating in it. And um okay. and it was, I mean, it blew my mind because that was the first time that I'd seen people skating in like a half pipe or like in a bowl and stuff like that. And 
so that was my introduction to like skate punk was through Devo. Oh, okay. And I was like, okay, that's really cool. But I didn't, I really didn't know what to even call it. And um, then I got really into Billy Idol, which of course leads you to Generation X mm. and you know, the Clash around about that time, like around 82, you know, hearing Rock the Casbah and, and Should I Stay or Should I Go and going, this is better than the other music that I'm hearing. And um, I think that kind of got me excited. And then we moved to England in 84. I mean, there I was, you know, at, at kind of ground zero for, for punk rock. And I mean, I, I did my homework. I, I mean, immediately it was getting The Clash's first album, Sex Pistols' first album, all the early Generation X stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then I, I really kind of understood where does this all come from? And then as I kind of started expanding, you know how it goes. You always want it, you know, like harder, faster, louder, right, I mean, right. hardcore. And then I'm, you know, I'm going, oh, man, I, I love all these bands from Southern California while I'm living in England. You know, like I discover it in the wrong place. And I'm yeah. there was, besides the stupids, there wasn't much going on in England that sounded, you know, anything like American stuff. So the stupids were they were like kind of one of the earlier the uh, first in the scene in terms of like that hardcore style right they were oh, for in, sure. in england in england were, who, were, who were there other bands who were some of the other bands like you know not, were, not were there... really at that time but there were bands that kind of pretty quickly like got going um as far as i remember visions of change used to be called the depraved and mm. they were kind of getting into that territory um yeah. but but then they they kind of quickly switched gears and and did this band called visions of change which was like a, almost like a semi emo band like and i'm not using that in like a derogatory term but they sure. were definitely more into like that revolution summer sort of thing um kind of bands that were associated with the stupids at the same time were a little bit more like, like that um the instigators um oh, instigators, were yeah it was a lot more like that and oh my god they were amazing and instigators are great as soon as the the stupids like hit and wound up like on the cover of like sounds and enemy and stuff then there were all these other bands that started popping up like you know doctor and the crippens and you know everybody wanted to get associated with you know the skate punk thing so you yeah. know mind warp or posing with skateboards pop will lead itself you know stuff like that anybody you know who could go down to meanwhile's or or crystal palace and hold a skateboard out in front of them were claiming that that's what they were yeah they were, yeah they're just posers well you know yeah, the world yes, has, has always been fun <laughs> Were you ever? Uh, were you, did you ever get into soccer, like uh, like the English no, soccer stuff? No, no, not at all, not at all. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. played, you know, with the kids in my village, and there were a lot of kids that lived in the village where I did. We would go out and play, and um, but it, I mean, it never really had like all that much interest for me, and mm -hmm. like I definitely didn't want to go to any of the the football matches because everybody was telling me, you know, oh, they throw darts, you know, you're gonna get a dart in the back of the head, and I'm right, going, right. I don't want to do it. I was just a little little guy. I was like the squirreliest littlest kid, so <laughs> I was like, not cut gonna, out, not gonna, cut out for hooliganism. No, no, not at all. And like, you know, the other thing was, is that like all of the like the really like tough skinheads and punks used to hang out on the steps of the the post office in Ipswich. Mm -hmm. And that was like our, our big, you know, city that was close to us. And um, just seeing them just out there just drinking their woodpecker cider and just doing nothing. Yeah. You know, but just like, you know, being somebody to look at made me go. I'm not really interested in that route. Like I don't, not, I don't want to be missing much. No, I don't want to be this burnout. I don't want to be, you know, getting darts in my head at football matches. Were people over there? Uh, was that a little too early for the awareness of st like straight edge, the whole straight edge thing or? Oh yeah, for yeah. sure. Uh, you know, and, and the stupids knew all about that sort of stuff, but you know, they weren't, they weren't straight edge. They weren't, you know, claiming to be any of that kind of stuff. Um, but they, it, it was, it was getting started and i i remember you know i i'd have x's on my hands and and going into work at the post office there were other gis that were really young they they were in their early 20s you know they'd see this kid coming in with you know these black x's on his hands and you know of course they just go is that satanism you into you into like, <laughs> like because i have a black x on my hand yeah you with 
Satanism. So Isn't yeah, that funny. That's what they automatically go to. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, it was it was a weird time, you know, where people just didn't understand things and yeah. made wild assumptions. So I was, you know, very definitely like on that bandwagon really, really early on. And I did a lot of my my first early work was like doing it for straight edge zines that I just mm. you know, do a drawing and send it to them and yeah, use it. I don't know. When uh, w- were you always into drawing? Were you always just were you doodling oh, yeah. on shit? And yeah, yeah. And so I I got to show this to you sometime. It's it's really pretty awesome. When I was really really little, this is pre Star Wars. So this is maybe I'm six years old. It's like seventy six or so. Um, there were there weren't really many things that you could get if you if you w- were a little guy and you wanted like toys or stuff. Star Wars did, wasn't making you know toys until like seventy eight. Right. And, you know, there were Mego figures. They were, you know, the dolls, the cloth dolls that were, you know, based on DC characters and Marvel characters. And those were cool, but they were kind of expensive. So we never had very much money. And I made paper dolls. And I, you know, I'd, I'd make them of, you know, Hong Kong Fooey and the Blue Falcon. Oh, uh, cool. Wow. But what I did was I my grandmother had, do you remember those spiral notepads that were all different colors? Spiral notepads. Well, there was like a there was glue on them, and they kind of spiraled up, and so it was like orange, and then it was green, and then it was yellow. Oh yeah, yeah. You're talking about the paper itself would be different yeah. colors. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I would get those, and and my grandmother was really cool about it. She was like, just go nuts. So I'd get you know kind of a an orange one, and I'd draw the body, and then I'd you know get the red for you know captain marvel's costume and i'd cut it out and then i'd put tape on it and then i'd get you know yellow for his lightning bolt and then i'd cut that out and put that on right i still have all these things oh wow they were really fairly remarkable for like a six or seven year old because i I didn't have anything and have you ever post posted any photos of those or have you really i don't think i don't know if i've ever seen that that's i love it i love it I still yeah. have them in, in a, a lunchbox. I, I have them right here at the house. I mean, I know exactly where all that stuff is because that was that was what I played with. You know, I, I like I said, I didn't have much money, so my mom was always very, very good at supplying me with crayons and paper. Right. And when we lived in Germany. She didn't speak German, and she didn't have a job. My dad was in the Air Force, and so she would she would clean up the house in the morning which took like maybe 20 minutes because it was a very small house and we didn't have anything. Right. And then it was just like, well, what are we going to do? And so she, you know, my brother was in kindergarten, so he'd go off to school and she'd be home with me and she'd be like, well, let's, let's draw or let's color. That's and so cool. we just sit around drawing and coloring and like my love of drawing 100% comes from like my mom and then my dad wow. would go and at work he worked close to where the motor pool was where they you know like rent out all of the vehicles for the base and the guys who worked there as mechanics were younger guys and they always had comic books and so when the comic books, you know, they would be too old or they've read them all, they'd just give them to my dad and he'd bring them home to me. So I I started when in Germany, you know, it's a combination of my mom's home and she doesn't have much to do. And so mm-hmm. she was drawing color with me, my dad bringing home comic books. And um, that's that just fueled my my imagination. And, you know, I, I've been drawing ever since. Which com- what kind of co- what comics were you into? Fantastic Four mainly was that was like that was like my favorite um mm. really really early on but Fantastic Four Batman Super Friends um you know anything that they they brought me and I still have some of those comics that I got in like 75 That's 70 incredible the the exact same ones still wow. missing the cover and and everything but they were like that was all I had so I mean I knew those things cover to cover you would just sort of mimic the styles when you, oh, when yeah. you just draw. Yeah. Oh, Were yeah. you, um, cause you like the pen is really your thing, right? You're yeah. you, like, you, I mean, you, I know you, you know, of course you paint, but do you have a, do you like, do you have a preference? Do you, do you like to draw more than you? It's this right here is the Sharpie. Sharpie. Yeah. You're That's the Sharpie that. master. It's really amazing. <sighs> It, it's something that I'm I'm so comfortable with, um, and and yeah, drawing is is definitely like my forte. 
But oil painting, and I haven't, I mean, I know we talked about this before, but oil painting is something that I really, really love. And I just, I don't have the space uh, to adequately do that and clean up anymore. It's, it's messy. It's, it's it so is. funky. Yeah. Um, that, that was always my thing too. I, that's why I, I, I went from to watercolors because it was easy and clean but then the acrylic stuff i you know the minute i knew i could just even wash that out of my clothes before it starts to set is right yeah. but yeah yeah it's it takes some space you know it does well and what i really like is you know my my dining room table is where i do paint and that's where i do like the acrylic stuff and i have a hair dryer that's plugged in yeah. I, you know, I don't need it for my head. So the hair dryer, I just I use on my paintings so I can speed up the process. And yeah. you can't do that with oil. So I mean, I when I do paint now, I do acrylics, but drawing is is always it's paramount. Like that's the number yeah. one thing for me. You can kind of tell, you know, it's just it's so you so masterful. I'm always it, it, no matter what, anytime I you post something on social media where a new piece. I, I I'm so inspired. I'll always try to I'll always whip out a sharpie and try to draw something, <laughs> and I'm just like I just he kills me. I hate it, but uh, you know it's an inspirational thing, man. I I always love it. I I just have tried for years. Um, what about what's your how, what about like digital stuff? Are you you are you uh do you hate that stuff? Are you embrace no, it? I, by no means do do I hate that or or anything. It's just I there. I, I, this will sound really stupid, but the resistance that the the pen or the pencil has on the paper, yeah, is something that I really like. It's it's probably a very akin to people going, well, no, the way a record sounds, you know, because right. of the needle and the groove, there is something about that. And in fact, when I'm working on like sharpie drawings, I I only use you know like regular sharpies. They're, they're I don't use special ones or anything, and I I use the smoothest um, computer copy paper that I can because it's got just enough tooth to to kind of give a little bit of resistance on the nib of the pen. And mm. there's something about that resistance that feels right. And if I use good paper if i use you know like um bristol board or stuff like that it does there's not the same drag and i can't produce the exact same type of lines i totally so get it because of that that real fine tuned thing i i prefer working you know just with with physical things and then yeah. scanning them in or whatever and and a lot of that too goes back to um this inner i i probably told you about this before but this interview with jerry dammers from the specials and Jerry Dammer, as uh, you probably know, created a lot of the look of the original mm. two-tone records. Right. And he had said that even when he's doing like a strip of checkers, that he draws them by hand. Ah. Because there's something like organic and genuine about like the hand-drawn stuff that adds a, a level of like authenticity and humanity in something that could be really sterile. Yeah. That really stuck with me, and I was like, "Damn, that guy's onto like some big ideas." And so yeah. that that thing in particular has always made me go, "Yeah, I really should be doing a lot of this stuff by my my own hand, scanning it into a computer, and then manipulating it from there." But I, it it usually always starts with just hand stuff. Yeah, well, it's cool and cool as long as you can see the digital stuff as a. It's just another tool. Oh, it maybe it makes it a little easier when you're doing specific work, and it's like yeah. it took it took me a while. I and I tried to embrace. You know, back when they just had the tablets with the you know the 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 stylus. You know, I, I it never felt right to me. I'd be in like Photoshop or whatever Illustrator, and I tried to do. And I'm like, um, have you messed around with like an iPad and the pencil? You know, the Apple pencil. No, I haven't. Not at all. And and I need to. It's, it's a trip. They like it. They they have figured out a way to make it feel like you're you're dragging a pencil or you're dragging a you know not it's not going to ever replace what you, you, the feeling you just described. But it's pretty pretty cool man it, they're doing a pretty good job <laughs> well, and i think i think i need to because i don't i don't ever want to be one of those people that's like a luddite where you just you know poo poo anything right modern or because that's yeah. stupid i mean it's 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 comical almost and by no means do i want to do that and and as an educator like i feel like i need to know uh a bit about that sure. because 
how, how does that look if, you know, kids are going, hey, I do a lot of this stuff on an iPad and I'm going, iPad? What <laughs> is that? You know what I mean? It's just, it's stupid. So I need to, I need to, uh, you know, experiment a bit. Yeah, it's it's fun. I, I I would never I'd never want to depend on just that, but I do enjoy getting better at that and having a better feel for it. Um, and and just sometimes I just want to doodle, like I'm I'm laying literally on my bed and and I don't want to turn on a light. So if I have my iPad right there, I don't have to turn shit on. I can just start, you know. And it's kind of kind of a nice thing. Well, and that's that's a really a nice benefit is that you know you don't need to be toting around a bunch of stuff with you and go mm -hmm. oh where did i leave that oh i don't have the right you know eraser or i can't do it because you know i don't have my special pen with me or whatever yeah yeah well um i mean you you've done so much friggin' work for so many bands uh yeah. like you st i mean obviously my own band we've had we some of my favorite stuff has been stuff that you've created for us but you. Uh, the descendants i mean would you say i mean the descendants is kind of like what you're known for right or, oh for sure i mean that's sure. the that's the big that's my calling card i mean you know i can tell people if they just go hey you so what do you do and and i can say I'm the primary artist for the descendants. Yeah. People go, oh, okay. Right. They know. That's just a place of uh, like understanding, like, what do I do? Um, yeah. That'll be on my tombstone, I'm sure. And that's <laughs> good. I'm happy with that. Of course. How did that all got come come about? How did you get hooked up with the de descendants? So that that happened via all. And so when when descendants, you know, had lost Milo and you know, they picked up you know, the various singers that they had worked with, um, they toured like crazy. Well, like you guys did. I mean, they were out on the road all the time and living in England, it was, it was more difficult for, you know, American bands to get over there as you know. And, um, so it, it was, it wasn't very frequent that, you know, American hardcore bands or punk bands were, were touring England. So for the Descendants initial run, they never made it over. And um, so when we moved back to the States, I was like, well, I don't care that the Descendants aren't playing, you know, all are, and they're my new favorite band. So yeah, now it's all. So they came on through summer at 88. Um, and I met them that summer and just kind of briefly. And then I think it was the the following year, 89, I had done a flyer for them for a show in Fort Collins when I was going to school up there. And Bill had seen it and wanted to meet the kid that did the drawing because it was a character of the band. Mm -hmm. They're all coming out of a coffee cup. And um, so he he said, um, hey, hey, yeah, you did that? Yeah, that, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I, I like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I was like, okay, well, you know, I'd love to do some work for you. I mean, I know you guys tour a lot and you probably need stuff. Yeah. Okay. And I just went, all right, well, you know, Bill just agreeing just was my green light to do something that right. I would be a t-shirt. So I did something and and just mailed it to them and they used it for a tour shirt in, in Europe and they got back and they didn't have any shirts with them. And I was like, so you used it and like, I, I didn't even get a shirt from this. And he went, <laughs> oh, it's cool. We want to use it again. So they used the same design for some other stuff. And um, I was like, whoa, this is, this is rad. Like my favorite band is, is wanting me to do stuff. So yeah. I kept doing stuff and, you know, eventually they wound up moving to Colorado and, you know, every time they'd come, we'd hang out a lot. And, you know, the, the more that we got to know each other, the more we realized we really got along as friends. And, you know, I'm, I just didn't stop. I mean, I was drawing all You the were time. living in Colorado at the time. Yeah. You, you, you yeah. had moved there and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was just, I was doing as much stuff as I could. And I was like, oh, cool. Well, they're going to be going out on tour. So I'm anticipating this. Let me do some stuff. And, and, you know, that was when I would mail stuff. I mean, I'd actually do the drawing and mail the actual drawing and just go, yeah. okay, cool. Use it if you can. Uh, Which is, I think, I still think is one of the coolest things that ever happened in the underground music, pop oh, rock, yeah. hardcore scene. Like, there were so many talented artists, just kids that yeah. loved the music and were huge fans, and they were just 
it, it, you know, even more than like, I want to get, I want to get my name out there. It was like, I just want to somehow connect with my favorite bands. And that was a perfect way to do it. You know, if you, if you were, nobody had a lot of money to spend. And, and so in that way, what, uh, what other punk artists do you, uh, do, what, who, who do you, who'd you like, you know, coming up? Like what were there? So, any- definitely at that time, like when I was first starting to get into stuff, I mean, it was, you know, it's the, it's the big three. I mean, it was, it was Pusshead, Brian Walsby and Pettibone. You know, oh, those, yeah, 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 yeah. Those yeah. are the three that more than anybody that that I associated with, because that was what I was seeing in England via maximum rock and roll. Yeah. Well, Pettibone, I, I I agree. It was funny. I just found a bunch of like Bessie sent me a bunch of old flyers, Reno flyers from back in the day. And I did this thing where I'd have I draw a character and then I'd have like a lot. It was a total Pettibone ripoff. Like I was yeah. so into that. And it was a because I'd I'd look at that and he'd have like a it'd be like two people talking. And there was so there was there was no it was such a mystery. Like, what is yeah. this from? Is this from a, a like a book, a comic right. and, and so I could totally back that style, but yeah, yeah. Oh, did yeah. You like, well, do you like uh, like Nick Blinko? Did you ever like his stuff, r- rudimentary peni stuff? So as <laughs> as a kid, um, I, I again associated that with the punks that were hanging out on the steps of the post office, uh, and it was like you know whatever. And yeah. I didn't really take any of that stuff very seriously at the time. Right now, I mean, I think it's absolutely genius. It's crazy. Yeah. It is. Well, it it kind of is, and you know. Obviously, the the mental illness that that Nick Blinko you know suffers from came yeah. through in his art, and I you know I think that's probably true of a lot of artists. <clears throat> you know, I don't <clears throat> I don't know whether Pusshead himself like has any you know mental issues or not. I don't I don't have any idea. But you don't produce that kind of work when you're just a super happy, secure, normal. <laughs> You know what I probably mean? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> you know, and, and by no means is that a slam. I love Pusshead's work, and and he's always been absolutely wonderful to me. Yeah. But I I feel like you're coming from like a place where you see the world differently, and absolutely. certainly certainly that's true about Pettibone. So, you know, like that stuff. As as much as I would also like, you know, try and emulate some of their styles. Yeah. That's not where my brain was, you know, right. my brain was kind of in the same place that Brian Walsby was in that, you know, we both grew up with Mad Magazine and, you know, Cracked and comic books and cartoons. And we're just going, cool, I can do fairly good characters of people. So why don't I, you know, do these funny drawings that, you know, make Bill Stevenson look like a an ogre or the missing link? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes sense. Like, you know, that's more of where I was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can. T- I, I love it, man. It's great. It, 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 to me, it, it it's just as important. The 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 artists, uh, they they were just as important as the the musicians and the fanzine writers and you know the, all the people. Everybody, it all it all c- came together and and it became this thing that we you didn't have to reach out to anybody on the outside. You just always knew somebody that could. If you couldn't do it yourself or somebody in your band couldn't do it, then you always had a friend that could do it, and that that was always a a special <clears throat> a special thing. I thought. What um, what other what other bands have you done? You you do a lot of stuff that's like the um, bifocal. Uh, mm-hmm. Puts out these great these great t shirts. You've done a ton of those, right? Who who have you I done? Have. Like what band? What other bands have you done? I know well, uh, the da- did you do the uh, something for the damned? I've done a few things. Damned, for the- yeah, yeah. Um, done stuff for the damned. Blink one eighty two. Right. Devo, Lemonheads, Bismarcky, Adolescence, Circle Jerks, Circle. Yeah, I mean, you know, just the list goes on. Everybody, on. yeah, yeah. yeah. And the the uh, bifocal thing was really kind of cool because you know, going back to Brian Walsby, Brian was working with Charles, who runs bifocal, and said, "Hey, you know, would you be interested in doing this?" And you know, he kind of told me how how Charles runs his business, and um, I was like. Meh. I don't know. I I don't know this guy. And and he was like, dude, I, I've worked with him for a while. Charles is really reputable and it's all very legitimate. People are going to get paid. And, you know, it's it's going to be more like an, an artistic take on doing stuff. So it wouldn't be like normal merch. Yeah. I like, okay, well, I guess I guess I could try that. And um, so I think the the Ian Mackay one that you're wearing was was the first one or at least one of the very, very first ones that I had done with Bifocal. And um, 
it was so weird because I had done that that Sharpie drawing and I was like, well, what the heck? Let me just reach out to Ian and and see what he says, you know, because I was like, <laughs> he's never, ever, you know, says, all right, here's an embrace shirt and here's a Fugazi. Like he doesn't do that. But I thought this is just a drawing of him. Yeah. Maybe we'll go for it. And so I wrote up this, you know, this you know, email to him, sent it off and kind of crossed my fingers. And um, really quickly, I heard back from him and he was like, if this is something that will help promote you as an artist, yes, I will do it. However, I will not promote it at all. And any of the money that would be going to me has to be donated to a charity of your choosing. And right. I was like, and it's, I mean, it's so... Ian, that was, the, you know, because he he didn't want to disappoint me and say no and and kind of squash like an artistic endeavor, right. but he wanted to make sure that his end of it would be handled in a way that he felt good about. Yeah. And the fact that he agreed to it was incredible to me. And I mean, I am so grateful to that. And, and yeah. He, stuck to his word it's a big deal man it's a big deal yeah. you know he's a, he's yeah and it's a great i mean it's one of my favorite shirts i love it so much and i you know you instantly know you just know oh who yeah you know is, who it is. You know? <laughs> that's great um so yeah i mean what what you know, i don't know what have you 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 played music for a while you were in a you've been in bands what what's the um is that kind of a thing of the past are you just sort of like not that crazy about the idea or are you well you know I, a... I i'll occasionally i'll occasionally do stuff at punk rock karaoke um you know stan and and uh and greg usually cajole me into doing something and i'm happy to do that um right but that was like Steve Soto would would always be like, "Hey Chris, you gonna do something with us tonight?" Yeah, uh, yeah. All right, Steve. Well, what what songs don't people usually do that you would like to play? And he was like, "Well, I love Suspect Device, but people usually don't pick it." And I go, "Then we'll do Suspect Device, you know, or whatever." I I you know I, I do that occasionally. And anytime Channel Three are in town, I've become kind of like the default Maria Montoya from "You Make Me Feel Cheap." So I do. <laughs> I do the backing vocals on that and which i always look forward to because you know how can you say no to channel three yeah and the sweetest guys man they're oh, so nice absolutely and great so, band underrated well, highly underrated i think in my highly opinion. highly um so i only do that and, and i really don't have any aspirations of, of doing anything beyond that but in high school we had a band evil knievel rice or epr for short because you got to have a three three you know initial band name. right yeah we were ekr and that was great i mean i that was that was definitely my favorite of the bands that i've ever done ekr and, uh, you, that was a high school band yeah oh yeah wow, oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so i was i was a, a senior our drummer was a junior um our bass player was a senior and our guitar player had just graduated and um it was great you know like none of us really knew how to play anything very well we kind of like learned on the fly like you do and right. it was so much fun i mean we we recorded a lot a lot a lot of stuff and um it was it was just fun you know it was just kids doing stuff with absolutely no hope of it ever going anywhere right. and you know, then it did i mean we we actually recorded stuff and put out a single and and then when we moved, uh, I say we, because three of those guys in the band wound up moving to Denver also. Um, we were in bands together when we were in Colorado. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I did a band called Pilot Car. I did a band called Sizewell. And those were, you know, both those bands lasted for a few years. And we wound up playing a you know bunch of shows. And Any releases with those bands? Did you ever put anything out? Yeah, um, Pilot Car had put out a split single. No, Pilot Car put out a, a, a regular, just the, our, our single. And um, then Sizewell had put out a split record with another Denver band called The Amirs. And um, that, that was really it. I'm looking up uh, Pilot Car right now. I'm looking <laughs> Pilot up. Car was the band that opened for 510 when you guys came through. Right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And I, I know I, was, I I'm on disc discogs and I, I realized yeah. I could, I could pick, pick up the seven inch <laughs> very cheaply because nobody wants it. 
Well, you know, hey, I under I know that all too well. There's a lot of my stuff. But, you know, it's always like a few years back. I wanted. I realized there was a couple things that I had been involved with that I didn't have copies of, and I'm like, yeah. I, I want them, but I, I, I don't know how to go about doing it. And someone said, just go, go check out Discogs because I looked up an eBay, and it was like. You know, but Discogs has been great. I've been able to find a lot of my stuff that nobody else wants, but I can find for really super cheap. So, uh, and some of that stuff is great. It's uh, speaking of five town, like oh my gosh, that and I'll, I so I was writing um reviews for a local uh, Denver music paper, the Hooligan, uh-huh. and Hooligan uh, had like I guess it was like ninety four. You'd know better than I would. It's like ninety four, ninety five when. Mm-hmm. Um, the 510 album came out and that was one of my picks for the year wow i had i had written this this glowing review <laughs> of and i had written a review for uh out the shizzy and the, the people who who ran hooligan were like i don't know that's a weird record and i was like it is but here's why it's really good and and i remember like going to bat for the record and going right. listen they are changing. They are going into these different directions, even still. But it's it's great songwriting, and there's some really good songs that are kind of like introspective mm-hmm. that that are not like anything that's been done before for them. And yeah. you can't deny the fact that you know music in general was changing at that time. So of course it's going to change. But yeah, I, I had written some things about records that probably on Discogs are are going to be fairly easy to find and, yeah. and all that much, but I love them. And I, I mean, I still stand by those records. Oh, thank Here you. Over. Thank you. I do too. I do too. I'm looking at the, the, the pilot card re- record, pilot card record. It looks like this was 64 of a thousand made. Yeah. I shouldn't, that, that's so. And, 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 and there was like a little best movie I saw in 93 and it gave you the option what, to write it out. And, and <laughs> so, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. We, we wrote, Oh my God. We, we put, we had gotten like you know those um the uh i guess mtv had done mtv raps cards and they had done headbangers ball cards and stuff like that we got a bunch of them at the flea market really 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 cheap so every release we had that stuff in there and we wrote on all of them okay every record we like opened up the flap and wrote something on yeah and then it, this was kind of something that like i thought was really clever and i know it's not but when you had the the flap in the back that the you know the plastic flap we put a pilot car sticker over it so mm-hmm. you literally had to destroy it to get into it oh. but when you did and you got in there was a pilot car sticker in there so every every release came with a sticker and it came with a random MTV raps or headbeggers ball card. And then there were handwritten messages by everybody from the band on the inside. Right. So we were all about like, it's well, pretty sharp. It's a cool looking record, man. Did you do all the, the did you do it? Did you lay it? At, did the design? Every, it's yeah, great. So, I like it. The vinyl is a really neat color. And thank you. Yeah. The, the inside there's, there's a little booklet. That's a really weird size. It's like, I mean, it looks like one of those, um, you know, the little propaganda, like religious pamphlets. That you uh, yeah. Have. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, uh, what's that? that size. It's really Ch- weird. Something chick. What was the Jack chick, chick? Player or something or Jack chick. Was it Jack chick was the, the you're talking about the little mini. Yeah. The little miniatures. That's, yeah. I think it was Jack chick. About. I want to say Jack chick. So or something. Chick. The, it's like this ridiculous little, little mini zine thing that you know i i did all the hand lettering for the songs and you know it's really cool looking yeah yeah yeah, it was it was one of those things that i just thought well we need to have like a really cool release and um and it i mean it it looked really good and i mean nobody's heard it but uh it was it was really fun it was i i loved that band i i loved all the bands that i did but that was a really fun one too and that was that was our bass player from evil knievel rice was playing in that band and mm-hmm. then right at the tail end um the guitar player for evil knievel rice moved to denver joined the band as second guitar player and then we broke up and then our guitar player stuck with us when we did size well and so mm-hmm. you know i've I've worked with guys from high school in both of those bands mm-hmm. yeah well oh. done man well done <laughs> what other record do you have any other vinyl like i could, I could go look up or could I? <laughs> 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 this is fun for us. This is fun for anybody else. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, well, I, you know, I've done. By the way, I don't care if it's fun for anybody else. This isn't about anybody oh, else. Cool. It's all Please, about my uh, entertainment. Um, yeah, no, I mean, you know, I've I've done, you know, backing vocals on stuff like on, you know, Leave a Light On. I mean, that's I right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's been other things here and there, but you know, nothing, nothing really too major. Oh, it's I know. Here's one that's great. Like people don't know this. So on. What is it? I think it's on. I think it's. It's not on Mass Nerd Area. It must be on Problematic. I think it's on All's Problematic album. The song "She Broke My Dick." Uh, <laughs> there's there's a part at the end where this fake doctor says, "You don't mind if I leave the needle. You don't mind if I leave the needle in while I prepare the cortisone." I mm. think is is the line, but. When when all we're working on it, Bill calls me up and he just goes, "Hey Chris, I, I want I want to I want to have you come up to the studio. I want you to do something." And I was like, "Okay, what?" And he goes, "I I want you to do backing like vocal on something." I said, "Okay." So he told me what it was, and I said, "Yeah, sure, I can do that." So um, I was like, "But you have to credit me as Doctor Jackie Von Cracky." Oh, <laughs> so funny. it's not credited to me at all. It's I see it. Dr. Yeah. Jackie Von Cracky, yeah, yeah, uh, that's funny. So, Why, how come you didn't want to? You didn't want the. You didn't want the legit credit. You just wanted to. You just wanted to. Well, I, I figured. Okay, look, I did the cover for the record, so I don't want to be obnoxious and like have like two things in there. Right. But I'm. I that was like a pseudonym that I would I would refer to my brother and anybody else as as Jack. <laughs> and um. Then if it was like the full name, it was Jackie Von Cracky. So we thought it would be really funny that, okay, well, I'm Jackie Von Cracky. It was just like Dale Nixon. It was like a good pseudonym that right. you could put in there and whatever. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I occasionally I'd think about wanting to do that kind of stuff or like somebody would ask me to do something. I'd think like, I'm going to come up with a cool name and then I can use it for other things. And I, I'd always at the last minute, like, go ahead and use it. Well, Dale Nixon is, is up for grabs. Cause um, it was so funny. I remember when Dag Nasty's four on the floor came out and it says guitars, Dale Nixon. Right. And there were some people that were like, do you really think they got somebody from black flag to, to play on the record? And I was like, no, Dale Nixon is Brian Baker. He was under contract with Bad Religion and couldn't do something as Brian Baker. Ah, uh, that's that he, explains it. I didn't know. I didn't know that pseudonym, and I was like, "That's brilliant!" So anybody can use that, and I, I thought that was the coolest thing ever. It is cool, and I, I, I remember seeing that, and I'm like, "Is it?" Because it was Greg Ginn was used that for stuff, right? It was yeah. right. Greg Ginn, yeah, bass on my war is credited to Dale Nixon because mm. Greg Greg played bass on that record and and essentially just played the bass version of the guitar on it. So right. yeah, it's it's Dale Nixon. Well, I just did a search, a domain search, just because I was thinking, look, if I can get DaleNixon.com, then I might use it for some future stuff. But it's taken. I mean, somebody's using DaleNixon.com. Yeah. Greg Ginn. <laughs> yeah it's parked you know it's parked it's not being used somebody is yeah, like yeah. Uh, what do they call that cyber squatting you know it, what's it called it's like uh when you when you grab it for a while people grab grab oh, up yeah. somebody did that with seven seconds.com i had it for years i remember that oh yeah we that. lost it because i didn't pay i just didn't i wasn't looking at bill we were on the road and i wasn't looking at the bills i was getting and we lost it and it ended up becoming like, and that, and I think they somebody reached out and said, "Oh, for fifty thousand dollars, you could have it back." And it was like, "Fuck you." Um, so all right, well, what um, what's 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 coming up? What's coming up in the future? What do you got going on? Uh, okay. We're gonna we're gonna watch uh, we're gonna watch um, the French Connection at some point, maybe yeah. the next ten years. And then, no, no, no. Uh, we're gonna do that soon. I feel like because like now that Lori's show is done and January is almost over, it feels like you know like things have really opened up again. And mm -hmm. actually, I told a lot of people like January is gonna be a crazy time for me. So February time, get back in touch with me. So there's a lot of bands that have been waiting on artwork, and and now I'm waiting to hear from them. They just need to get back in touch with me. Yeah. But, um. I'm I'm working on I have to do that this weekend slash early next week. Um some 
uh, coffee bag designs for rad coffees out of Upland. They've paired up with Punk Rock Bowling this year as the official coffee sponsor for Punk Rock Bowling. Uh-huh. They're going to do a Punk Rock Bowling blend that I'm doing the artwork for. So I'm going to do cool. a bag design and like a t-shirt or whatever. But all the artwork is going to kind of like go along with looking like it's you know like maybe a punk rock flyer type thing so i i have that to do which is that that's kind of a pretty big important one and i feel like there was some other bands that were kind of like waiting on things i guess i guess i just need to hear back from them and usually when punk rock bowling starts really getting going with things in early january um usually todd huber who does the art end of things is getting in touch with me saying hey we got another club show and would you mind doing something for that because i I did a one of the posters for one of the club shows already Mm -hmm. um, which they haven't announced yet so uh, i'm sure i got more stuff to come with that are you have you have you gone to every punk rock bowling ever no no i i the first one i went to was in 2011 when descendants first played and And, you know, Steve Soto had been trying to get me to go before, but there was a time when it wasn't during the summertime. It was, it was more in like, you know, I want to say like March. Um, no, I, that is when they're doing, maybe it was in, I, I don't know. It, it wasn't during the time that, you know, the Memorial Day weekend. Yeah. And I, I was always like. I don't know. I'm not really much of a bowler. And, and it, you know, it was early on. It was, it was very, you know, BYO centric bands. And, um, I don't know. I, I just, I hadn't gone. So when Descendants played, I was like, yes, I'm going to be there. And immediately, you know, I fell in love with the, the festival itself and mm-hmm. like, just the whole workings of it. I mean, you know, for me, that's like one of my favorite things out of the year. Yeah. Um, so, 2011 was when I first started going, and I've only missed, I think, one since then. Wow. That's pretty amazing. I mean, yeah. Been, you've seen some. I, I've, I've played a few times, but I don't think I've just gone. I don't. I, I haven't just gone. You don't like that stuff. I, I mean, yeah. That. I see. It's it's like knowing the year there and, 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 and some our, some of our friends are there would make would be the, the best part of it for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. But the, you know, I can, I can, but I can start to do the. I can try to weigh the, the options, and then I realize that I would walking around. I start to get grumpy, and oh, you know I what know. I mean. Like it's I've just been like, there with you. I know. I know. I, I, know. Know. I, know. Well, but, but, really cool. but I think about like the it's not dead fest, and you know when I had that that art booth thing there, like that was really fun because you were stuck there, and so it was yeah. great have you at the booth too and you know we were all able to just hang out because i didn't i mean i only saw two bands i think i think i saw descendants and um dickies and that was it Mm -hmm. so just like hanging out and just being able to just be together at something like that was really really fun yeah it's i i love to going out for food and coffee and and oh yeah hanging on the on the strip and just talking shit that's probably my favorite part like then it's like oh that's right we gotta go we gotta go ctsol or whatever you know it's 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 almost second you know yeah it's a it's a spectacle you know i remember you know just thinking i love i you know i always get excited about every year i see i see that when they start to tease with the shows and but then i'm like i don't know it's in vegas and it's th- four days or it's four days right is it three four days four yeah because it's three? They, well they i mean they'll, they'll get started on like a thursday but friday is really where things kind right. of more kicked off and then saturday sunday and then monday so i mean it's yeah, i guess it's five days maybe yeah it's, it's fun it's always fun a lot of fun um hey i want to ask you what was the worst job you ever had can can you think of that real quick yes and it, and in term okay so the two-part question you told so, me well you told me some interesting things last time we talked but yeah i, yeah, I did i did yeah. um well you, right outside of high school i i worked in kind of like a can well there there was one where i worked in kind of like a target it was our base px bx and um that that was bad in that like our our supervisor was very difficult and it was an early morning stock boy so i was i was up at 4 30 in the morning and working and i mean it wasn't it wasn't bad it was just menial labor and it wasn't really very interesting 
when I came back uh, in January, I, I, I quit the job because like we weren't very happy with it. And my brother and I were having donuts at our lunch break. And we were like, man, it'd be so much better if we could just go to a record store right now. And he was like, let's do it. Let's just march in. We'll just march in and we'll both quit like right now. And I went, right. cool, let's do it. So we did. We marched in and we quit. And that was great. And then um, I got hired in January to work in like a convenience store on the base too. And that was awful because my manager was was bonkers. And um, that was not enjoyable at all. But I was working still as a stock boy. And those menial labor jobs were like, okay, well, I don't want to do that anymore. And um, so I, I figured I needed to get like an education and, and you know, try and elevate myself a little bit. Mm -hmm. So while i was getting an education and and doing all that i i wound up meeting lori and when i finally started teaching you know, we had one summer where her family was was doing um they were they were building machines that treat industrial wastewater and they were doing a lot of work in the oil fields in in wyoming and in idaho and so we we were invited to come on up and work in the oil fields and by no means was that like a, a bad job in that I worked with bad people or whatever, but it was, it was hard work, you know, being in the oil fields and, and physically having to be in these water pits and digging out these filtration systems and cleaning them. That and, sounds I mean, awful. It was gross, but yeah. I mean, it was working for Lori's parents and that was great. And oftentimes Lori was there with me and that was great. But it was hard work. It was really long hours, and it was relentless. Like yeah. I'll never forget, we we had worked all day, and we got back at dinner time, and um, she said, uh, "Okay, after dinner, you guys got to go out to another one of the sites that's two hundred miles away." And we, I mean, again, we had worked a full day. So I went, all right, well, let me just get something to eat for dinner and let's let's get in the van and let's take off again. And we just took off. And like that's so like in my mind, that always program programmed in like 200 miles is three hours, you know, like as you're driving. Yeah. So that's always like my th that was where that came from. And we'd get there and we'd have to be at work. And, you know, sometimes it was a matter of like watching the um, machinery through the night. And so maybe every three hours we had to check on things. So it was hard. It was yeah. really hard. And I, I, I think I fractured my ankle that summer, but we were in the middle of Wyoming and there weren't really many places we could go. So I put my boot on and went right back out to work. And I was like, <laughs> I'll lace up my boots tighter and hopefully it'll not hurt <laughs> oh man it just sounds awful like how long, how long did you do that for just the summer you just know summer, yeah. but, but, you know i got done i was like damn i i worked in the oil fields all summer and it's that's pretty amazing yeah very very different you know environment you know yeah. we talked about this before but it it gave me a like a deeper appreciation for of mice and men and like that whole bunkhouse mentality of just like just these these dudes that are just doing this physical labor that's yeah. that's just rough and like the camaraderie and solitude that you have in the presence of these guys it was like every morning you know you get up and you'd have this big breakfast together and nobody's really talking you know everybody's just like prepping in their heads for what is about to have yeah so that, yeah. Was, that was weird it was weird Every, that sounds like when I when I had this for a, a construction job for for just a couple of months, and we built a house from start to finish. Yeah. And I just wanted to do it just to say down the road, hey, I helped build this house out in Lemon Valley, yeah. Nevada. But it was exactly that. I we'd we'd all meet up super early in the morning. I even have a car. My friend would have to pick me up. We'd meet this little cafe eat everybody was just kind of getting prepared for it and then there'd be the long drive out to the where the site was and it was just you and your co the guys that you worked with and for eight ten hours yep. and the only entertainment would be like they somebody would bring a radio and play whatever top 40 station i, well, I just remember a radio yeah, yeah. Have that. <laughs> to this day when i hear um 
running uh, running on empty jackson brown yeah. yeah he had a live version that was a hit um and there were like key songs that if i hear it i'll always go back to this just being out in the middle of just freezing cold temperatures knowing that i had a fear of heights and they'd say like kevin you got to go up on the roof you know once we got it fixed and i'm like or built and i'm like i i'm gonna i i'm gonna die i know i'm gonna you know but uh but i got to it i made it to the very end and then i said take this job and shove it (laughs) doesn't that i mean doesn't that feel really good when you know that you're you're facing something that's going to be difficult and you just go you know what it does it does i mean i i like to say oh i don't care about that kind of stuff but yeah if i do you know i care about that you know yeah yeah. it is it is important because i've quit on a lot of jobs just i've i've worked and just said i'm done and i i I did have some regret where i'm like "Eh, i could have hung in there a little bit longer you know for what you know, well, but- I needed a paycheck. That was the biggest. Oh thing. yeah, <laughs> there's that. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. You're right. It's it's nice to be able to like finish, go from start to finish, and you can kind of have this little, even just quiet pride that you you got through it. And oh it. well, for me, I'm always like you know the light at the end of the tunnel guy, mm-hmm. always, always, and I'm going. You know what? I know it's difficult these next three years. But after that, and and as long as I know that that light at the end of the tunnel is coming, yeah, virtually anything, and and not really mind doing it so much either, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm I'm pretty good like that. I you know I like you have a really really good work ethic and am very driven by by what I'm doing, and I. I know it's so cliched, but I, I always feel like any job worth doing is worth doing well. So do the do the absolute best that you can and just like push on through. I, I agree. I'm my work ethic though is is really fueled by if I'm super passionate about something, that's when it kicks in. If it's something that I know I, I have to do because I just need to make a paycheck. I kind of go back and forth with it. Sometimes there is a principle of it and I'm like, no, just do it. It's good for you. You're, you know, but then there's times where I just can't, if it's really my like soul sucking work, like where you, you, you like, you realize I was talking to somebody recently about being a dishwasher. I've always loved that job and, and it's not a great job. It rarely pays good, but and it is just you're doing the same thing. It's there's never an end to it. You just you get done, got everything all clean, and then next thing you know, there's this you know trays of dirty dishes. But that's the kind of job where I would always get really fired up to just do a really good job. And and sometimes they'd like the boss would say, "Well, we could hire another person if you need help, but you're doing such a good job." I'm like, I don't need another person. Let me just take you know, yeah, weird pride over being like the guy that could do the job of two people, you know, like, but but I have that weird pride too. It's like when I was working with, with Lori's parents, they were like, if you don't tell him talking about me, if you don't tell him he can't lift that or move that, he won't realize that he can't. (laughs) So I was always just like, yes, you know, by no means am I tough, but, but I will get the job done and there's like this pride that like i did something that was difficult yeah like you know like working and doing all that dishes stuff and knowing that it was only you that was doing it you can it's isn't isn't that funny i just (laughs) um i just replaced our toilet seat cover has been loose forever since we like right after we moved into the house that we're living in it just has been sort of loose and become looser now i i i could have gone and bought it and got and research it but in my mind it was like Oh my God. It means I have to like go back there and un- unscrew things. And, and I, it just, I, it terrified me. I finally did it. We also were, we were gifted at Christmas. Our friends, uh, Danielle and, and fish gave us a, um, <laughs> a bidet, you know, the little, oh, uh, finally, connection. finally good. And it's changed your life, right? We've had it since we've had it since December. Oh, you have been, put it in. Actually, I think they gave it to us before December. Oh. It, sat, it sat in the box, brand new, just sitting there on top of uh, the, the our doggy crate. So yeah. I would see it every time I walked by. It. And finally, I just got the wild hair like uh, two weeks ago. I'm like, I'm okay, I got to go get a new seat cover or, you know, lid. And then I got to figure out how to do this. It's life changing. I, I told you. I know. I, we had this conversation. I know. I, and I know. told you you'll never go back. 
I use it even when I don't have to use the bathroom. I just go in there and just, you know, <laughs> hose them. No, it's it's amazing and 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 and, and I, it, but it pisses me off that it took me that long to like but what I was going to say is when I was done I I was at work there's nobody to beam about it. I was like really proud. I'm like I did. You can call me. I will be ha- like trust me. I will get stoked. I should have I know you would and I should I didn't even think about that but I was so proud and I'm like I texted Al and I'm like uh we got a bidet and it works like and and she was she was proud of me but I'm like how sad is that like and I I think I said like that's the manliest thing I've done in months like that's the most that's like the most like all right I'll let me take care of it honey I'll do it need I remind you how <laughs> this podcast started and I'm bragging about putting in pins on the van (laughs) it's the same thing (laughs) but it's i mean it's true and like trust me i know what you're talking about because i'm looking right now at this bathroom uh light that i got lori for christmas last year yeah is is you know it's one of the ones that that it's got an exhaust fan on it so it'll suck the the hot air out of the the bathroom yeah we haven't put that up since last i don't i don't mean like christmas that was like a month ago right you're in a month ago wow right there so let me know i can come by and uh, if if, (laughs) if you're just too lazy to do it chris i'll come by uh you know what it reminds me of is the breaking bad episode where walt goes out and gets the he finally replaces the water tank and then he really gets into it he replaces the rot and stuff like that yes i i always i kind of was like he had time to because he was done a good job So it's all about like, when can you have time? And like, that was the thing. Like we just, and I'm looking at it right now and going, (laughs) you know, we got to get to that. And then it was, look, when Lori's art show is done, we're going to get to it. And then it was like, this weekend's full and this weekend's full. Cause I have to get up in the attic and, and, you know, install it from there and Mm -hmm. some pipe work and stuff and it'll be fine. And we definitely are going to do it in, in February, but I understand. Yeah. I mean, the exact same thing. That's awesome. Well, on that note, I think we've we've kind of discussed all we needed. Is there anything you'd like to say to my hopefully uh, growing audience at, at the at, by the time it comes out? Yeah, I you know I do. Um, I part of part of why I'm doing what I'm doing and as involved in music and stuff as I am is is 100% thanks to you. And I know this is going to be the stuff you're going to want to edit out, but it's it's absolutely true. And I know I've told you this before, but like getting into teaching in particular is is really because listening to, you know, very um positive like lyrics about change and like wanting to do stuff and looking out for other people it got me in that mindset of okay well then what job can i do that's going to help serve that purpose and that was teaching and it it is in in direct response to a lot of the music that i listen to just wanting me to to think we we can make things better so where do you sure you have to start with kids I think that's amazing, and it's true. And I and, and I, Al and I just had this conversation because she didn't grow up like a punk rock person. She got into it later, but she's always had this sort of mentality that kind of goes right along with when we all started getting into stuff, and we had this sense of independence and sense of like not do gooders so much but just like wanting to contribute and make at least the little world around us a little bit better yeah. and at the very least not add to the crap that that yeah. we we all can can add to if we if we let ourselves and um it, it there was i talking with bessie last night my friend jay do you know jason traeger have you guys ever met do you know not face to face i mean we've we've been in we've been in touch with each other i mean uh, talking about a great punk rock artist i don't know if you're familiar oh, with his work but i am he's and i and just fine art like his own it's stuff fine art stuff and, uh, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful but just talking with all these people friends of mine that i've known for so long um it, it's easy to go you know so when we were kind of doing the punk we were doing part of the punk scene a hardcore scene but it really was just it, it dawns on me just how much the the people that i cherish in my life that i really want to stay close to um 
everybody has that same thread, you know, like they're, and they're doing like uh, uh, so many of my friends are teachers. It actually makes me envious. And it makes me go, you know, I, I really kind of wish I could have been, I could have, I would have tried my hand at teaching because I could imagine how it's but, but frustrating. You did. That, you I know? mean, not, not in the traditional sense, but you did. And you can, I mean, you ask, ask you. Ray Capo, um, you ask Porcel, ask Walter. <laughs> They will tell you the exact same thing that that there was a lot to learn from and and not just you but like the whole SST work ethic and and oh how yeah it, yeah like that stuff is embedded in my DNA at this absolutely point. and I've taken that into my classroom and not only to to become a teacher but also the environment that I've created within my classes and the drama department in general like what do I want how do I want to affect change on kids where they can take that with them and then help to affect change in whatever career they wind up doing yeah that all comes that comes from people that have been teaching in a non-traditional sense with I hear what you're saying and I agree and I and I feel like I've I've uh I was a student. I've been a student. I still am to, 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 oh, yeah. you know, to learning about things that at some point in my life, I, I just never thought I'd ever have the courage or the, the wits to, to, to tackle it. And then when you're doing it, you're just like, oh, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm at, you know, I'm adding to the, the, so, but thank you just as well. And, and I, and also, you know, just, uh, I, I try and tell my, all my friends that are parents, you know, and you meet their kids and they're amazing kids. You know, I always want to, I always make this note to say, I want to tell, I want to thank them more for creating a good or good human beings oh, for the future. Yeah. Because man, you know, think of the, 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 the that could go wrong so quickly, you know? Yeah. And, 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 and then it's not just like, this is what we're stuck with, but it's what society kind of has to deal with. If, if you have a kid that goes bad and embraces all the darkness and the negativity and stuff, who knows what they're capable of doing in, in, in an awful way. So, so thank you, you and Lori for being amazing parents and, and, well, and yeah. bringing some I mean, and, and kid in them. Incredible. But you're right. I mean, I, I see so many kids in my classes that, if they've got a good head on their shoulders, chances are they, there's a good parent or parents in the picture right. for sure. that, that want to make sure that things are going well for their kids. I mean, it's it doesn't just happen from nowhere. No. And, you know, I feel like we've got to spread it. You know, you, you've got to, you know, kind of like get something good and then, you know, continue to perpetuate that, you know, with your kids and, and not like do as I say, not as I do, but lead by example. Right. And go, if you really want to be, and it's, it's so cool. Cause like, I've noticed that Sam has picked up on a lot of the generosity that Lori and I bestow on whomever, you know, whether Absolutely. that's, you know, friends that are like in, in, you know, actual need of like financial help or somebody that just needs emotional help, you know, they just need somebody to talk to, or, you know, they need an escape or whatever. Sam does the exact same thing with his friends. That's and awesome. He listens and he does. And I mean, that makes me feel good because it's like, all right, he's going to carry that on. And the people that are in his life, he's going to be affecting. And that is where that spread it comes from for me is like, yeah. We can we can all be a part of making society a better place rather than just you know being beat down by it and just going all right I'm going to accept that it's it's terrible it it could be but I'm going yeah. to it's not yeah I agree and I and I, and I think maybe as I get older I'm realizing that it is is there are times when I really do just feel like why do I give a shit you know but I I do know why I give a shit and 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 I can only hope that I, I will continue to give a shit and you know all, of all the generous wonderful things that you've shared and given to me and bestowed upon me uh turning me on to uh well done grilled cheese sandwiches it, like oh, the, yeah. <laughs> slightly I mean that might be one of the biggest ones if I could figure out a way to give you an award for that I would I would do that I, I know <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> That's very insider-ish now. Nobody it really is. It. People are going, what are you talking about? Is but this, try it. Don't don't, don't don't sleep on it. Try oh, it. Oh, I know. I know. 
Yeah, I, I'm sure people are like, yeah, Kevin, we get it. It's really good. We already know. <laughs> well, my friend, I love you very much. I'm always, I, 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 I always appreciate that we get to uh, hang out, and and it's always better in person. But uh, this oh, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. You. and like I said, I wanted, I wanted immediately. I wanted that you in on this as soon as, <laughs> as soon as we could make it happen. And and just a disclaimer, we did this. We did the. Um, <laughs> We did it, and, and it was great. run. It was great, but I don't even think I told you this. I I watched it and listened to it, and I felt so nervous, like because you know it's weird when you're talking with somebody who you know oh, very yeah. closely, and and you've had these good conversations already, like very seamlessly. But then it's like there's this weird formality involved, and I and and, and I'm trying to make this warm, keep it warm and friendly and stuff, but. I, I was like, I could do better. I could do better. I Chris, I owe Chris a better hosting. And so you, know what? Uh, you didn't get into Chris Farley territory. So that was cool. No, not yet. But remember yeah, when he do that where he's just like, you, so you remember when <laughs> did that when you're in the Beatles? <laughs> Cool. Yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, that was one of the reasons that I sort of avoided the idea of wanting to do a, a, a an interview podcast because I thought I can. I've done interviews with people for zines, and oh, yeah. I've done a million interviews as the interviewee. But I just was like, no conversation. Know. Yeah, it's fun, and, and and I hope that it. I hope me. Yeah, I'd love to just be able to maintain that throughout the whole thing. Um. Well, so I don't know. We'll have to hang out very soon. soon oh yeah, we this weekend's packed. Um, yeah. But beyond this weekend, I'm you know things are looking pretty good for us. So okay, yeah, most very look. very very soon. All right, we need some coffee and food and oh yeah, hang out and uh, all right, my friend. Well, much love to you, <laughs> and uh, we'll 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 talk soon. Okay, thanks, Kevin. <laughs> all right, Chris. Thanks. 